Have you ever noticed the moon in the sky and thought to yourself, gee, it looks kind of low? And I don't just mean when the moon is rising in the east or when it's setting in the west. Of course, by definition, the moon is very low when it's rising or when it's setting. But if you live in the northern hemisphere and you're looking to the south and you see the moon in the south, well, that's as high as the moon is going to get for that day. And still, it sometimes seems kind of low, especially in the fall. So that's what I'm going to talk about. That's what I'm going to explain in this video. So just to illustrate this with a little bit of phone camera footage, here I am in Toronto in early October, looking south. You can see the moon at about first quarter phase. And I tilt up with my iPhone, not quite to the overhead point, which would be 90 degrees, just because I didn't want to tilt my neck that much. Uh, but that gives you an idea of how low the moon is. Its altitude above the horizon is probably about 20 degrees. It's a bit of an estimate, so that might be off by a couple of degrees, but that's the ballpark. Now this question about the seasons is interesting. You know that the seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth's axis. When the northern hemisphere, for example, is tipped towards the sun, we call that summer in the northern hemisphere. It would be winter for the people down in the southern hemisphere and vice versa when the axis is tipped in the other direction. Okay, so that involves the Earth and the Sun. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with the Moon. The Moon doesn't know, so to speak, what season it is. So why does this low Moon thing have anything to do with the seasons? Why does it happen in the fall and not at some other time of year? So let's get into it. We're going to do a little Astronomy 101, but I promise we're going to keep things pretty simple. When you look up at the night sky, you see all sorts of stars and planets and perhaps also the moon. And if it's daytime, of course, you could also see the sun. Now, it's useful to imagine that all of those objects are attached to the inside of a gigantic half dome, kind of like a huge umbrella. Of course, this dome isn't a real physical thing, but it's a useful device for understanding how things appear to us from down here on Earth. And, of course, it would really be a whole sphere, not just a half sphere. It's just that you can't see the bottom half because it's below your horizon. It's down underneath you. Astronomers call this sphere the celestial sphere, and that's about as jargony as we're going to get. By the way, I love these old diagrams. They're from a book called The Stars by H. A. Ray, published way back in 1952. Now, on the celestial sphere, there are two circles that are going to be critical for us. One of them is really, really simple. It's called the celestial equator, and it's just the projection of the Earth's equator out onto the celestial sphere. And the second circle is called the ecliptic, and that's where the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun intersects the celestial sphere. To put it another way, the ecliptic is the imaginary line that the Sun follows over the course of the year. As well, the Moon and the planets also stay pretty close to that line. Just to recap, the Earth and the other planets all orbit the Sun in approximately the same plane. So you can think of the solar system as a big pancake or a giant frisbee. But the Earth's axis is not perpendicular to that plane. Instead, as we've said, it's inclined by 23 and a half degrees. If it wasn't tilted, if it actually was perpendicular to the plane of the solar system, the celestial equator and the ecliptic would be the same thing as each other. But the axis is tilted, and therefore the celestial equator and the ecliptic are inclined with respect to each other by this amount, 23 and a half degrees. Now, what I'd love to do at this point, if I had my own private planetarium, is invite you all over and we'd do a planetarium show, and this would all be super clear. But I don't have one, so we'll have to settle for the next best thing. We're going to take the celestial sphere and flatten it out into two dimensions so that we can look at it on our flat screens. And by the way, this is what we do with terrestrial globes all the time. The Earth is a sphere, but there are various ways of projecting the Earth onto a flat sheet of paper. That's how we make maps. You've probably heard of Mercator projection. That's an interesting one, because it shows lines of latitude and lines of longitude as straight lines. Now, it has some other issues. For example, it exaggerates the size of land near the poles compared to land near the equator. That's why Greenland looks so huge on Mercator maps. But for mapping the celestial sphere, Mercator projection is actually really useful. 
that's because we don't care about sizes. We're not going to compare the size of the Big Dipper to the size of Orion or anything like that, but we do need to keep track of north and south, and Mercator is really good for that. Okay, let's do it. Let's stretch out that celestial sphere. We'll get our ruler out, and we're just going to draw a line across it horizontally. And that is going to represent the celestial equator. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to draw the ecliptic. It's a curved line that will intersect the equator, and it's going to look like this. So here we are, we've flattened out the celestial sphere onto a flat sheet of paper. Here's the celestial equator and the ecliptic. As I mentioned, the ecliptic is the path that the sun follows over the course of a year. For example, that's where the sun would be at the time of the vernal equinox, as it heads from the southern sky up into the northern sky. So that's late March. As we head into summer, the sun would be up here. This would be around June 21st. We head into fall, and so this would be around September 21st, the autumnal equinox. Of course, it's the same thing. We could put it over here because it's literally the same spot. It just uh, loops around like a 1980s Pac-Man screen. And winter, for folks in the Northern Hemisphere, this is winter. Of course, this is summer for people in the Southern Hemisphere, the sun reaching its uh, southernmost uh, spot on the ecliptic. You'll notice I haven't said anything about the stars or the constellations. Well, of course, they would be here. They would be sort of fixed on the map because the stars don't move relative to the equator or the ecliptic. Of course, they appear to move as the Earth rotates, but that's something else. In fact, the ecliptic is where you would find the so-called zodiac constellations. So the winter zodiac constellations would be up here at the, the top of the diagram. This is where we would find Gemini, the twins, and Taurus, the bull. Uh, whereas down here at the bottom, you would find summertime zodiac constellations like Sagittarius and Scorpio. And just a quick clarification, the reason I'm calling Gemini and Taurus winter constellations is because that's when it's easiest to see them in the sky. You can most readily see a particular constellation when the sun is in the opposite part of the sky from it. So you get a nice view of Gemini and Taurus when the sun is down in Sagittarius or Scorpio, and vice versa. Now, I haven't said anything about the moon yet. The moon also follows this path, the ecliptic. It does it faster than the sun. It only takes about 30 days to go once around instead of a whole year. So let's put the sun back in here just to give a bit of an example. If we had a new moon, well, the new moon is dark. You, you don't see the moon when it's new, so there's not that much to say about it. Well, you would see it, you would notice it if there was an eclipse, but that's a whole other thing that we don't need to get into. If it's a week after the new moon, you would have a first quarter moon. So this is a springtime first quarter moon, and in springtime the first quarter moon is very high up in the sky, which is something you might notice. About a week after that you would have a full moon opposite the sun, and when the sun sets the moon would be coming up, and about a week after that you would have the last quarter moon. Now, the thing with the, so this is a very southerly moon, and we've been talking about the moon being south, but this is a last quarter moon, which you tend not really to notice very much because it doesn't even rise until usually around midnight or so, so that the sun will have set and a lot of people are asleep when the last quarter moon is prominent in the sky. Okay, let's talk about other times of the year. We can talk about what happens in summer. In summertime, a first quarter moon would be on the equator, not too far north, not too far south, just in the middle. Now, a summertime full moon would, in fact, be quite far south, so you might notice that. But, of course, the full moon is rising when the sun sets, so when a lot of people are out and about, the moon is just popping up above the horizon. And so, as I said before, the moon is by definition low in the sky when it's rising or when it's setting, so you're less inclined to sort of notice how low it is, because it has to be low. So let's skip ahead to fall. So this is the autumnal equinox. 
we can also put it over here because it's exactly the same thing. So this is around September 21st, and this is where things get interesting because it's the, it's the fall first quarter moon that's quite low. So again, although there are other times of the year when the moon can be low, in fact, it, it has to reach this spot once a month no matter what. But if it's in the fall, it's going to be 90 degrees or so away from the sun, which means it will be at first quarter phase. And the first quarter moon is something that's very noticeable because the first quarter moon is prominently visible just as the sun is setting. The sun goes down, the moon is 90 degrees over from the sun, so it's prominently visible in the sky. But if it's, if it's fall, if it's September or October, the first quarter moon is going to be quite far south. And you'll look up in the sky and you'll say to yourself, gosh, the moon looks pretty low. And it's not like the moon just rose in the east or that it's about to set in the west, far from it. You'll be looking south, which means the moon is as high as it's going to get for that day. And still, it's pretty low. And that's it. That's why the moon sometimes, especially in the fall, looks kind of low in the sky. Thanks for watching.